that's a good that's a good thing to uh, talk about today is entertainments on your computer. There are lots of them. Especially the free stuff. Yeah, there's lots of free stuff and there's lots of stuff that you pay for. Uh, and as far as entertainments go, uh, the world is your oyster. As far as music goes, um, movies, um, streaming services like Netflix, um, eight bucks, that is, that's a great deal. Um, yes. Yay, yay free. Okay. Um, the, the most entertaining free entertainments out there uh, are number one, YouTube. YouTube videos. As well as entertainments, the, the uh, YouTube is excellent for learning stuff. There are how-to videos out there to beat the band. If you have a new gadget, somebody out there has put up a video about uh, with a review of, of whether it's worth buying, how to use it, how to get the most out of it, um, the ins and outs of, of setting it up and using it properly. It's great that way. There's, there's most excellent stuff on YouTube. And, and searching YouTube is almost exactly the same as searching in Google. Have an idea of what you're searching for. In this case, plumbing. Okay, so you're going to search up plumbing, toilets, replace valve. It's that simple. The most uh, YouTube videos are um, three to five to seven, ten minutes. Um, the, lots of times people have put up pirated material. Um, entertainers. Um, some of their best work is on YouTube. But it's pirated material. Somebody's put it up there. YouTube does their best to take it down, but um, it's so you, you can find these kinds of entertainments. Discovering new artists is another good use for YouTube. If you're if you're into uh, if your music tastes are very eclectic. Finding new artists is uh, on YouTube is a great thing because uh, now uh, musicians, um, when they're just starting out, put up their music videos and their music on YouTube first. They don't have a record deal. They're trying to build a following. And so they use social media to, um, to alert people on Facebook or Twitter that they have a, a new single out with a video. It's on YouTube. There's the link. And you'd be surprised at, at how many hits they get of people wanting to, to discover new music. The thing that they have to be is talented. There has to be some talent there, either writing or performing. But YouTube is great for them. YouTube, uh, Google and YouTube do their best to make sure that their sites are going to be clean of all of this nasty stuff. But in some instances, it's just uh, it can be overwhelming. You can you can catch things, especially if someone sends you a link to a YouTube video. If you go searching yourself on YouTube, you're pretty good. You're pretty safe. Yes, you can. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to have an account to search YouTube for information, videos, music. Um,
Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Now, um, Aries. Uh, A R E Z. Yes. Aries. Okay. Um, my recollection of Aries is that, in actual fact, it's a peer-to-peer -peer sharing site. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, peer-to-peer -peer sharing. What you're doing is you're stealing. <laughs> and he put up the music when he found it somewhere else, and he's sharing it on his computer, which you go and get to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if, if you... Okay, what we're talking about here is, what's the word I'm looking for? N no. Um, stuff like that. Um, it's what we did. It's unethical. There you go. That's what, that's what I was looking for. The ethics of, of what you're doing on Aries. And, and all of these other peer-to-peer -peer sharing sites. Um, well, it can happen. I mean, uh, there people have been picked at random out of the blue by the um, MPAA and been sued. Twelve hundred bucks a pop, and if somebody's got a hundred songs on their computer, the MPAA wants a million dollars, and they will. Yeah, and you know what? They have been winning. They have been winning, um, for the most part. Um, they they have high powered lawyers that they pay millions of dollars a year to go after little folks like you to make an example of you. Okay. Well, why would they, is, do that? they keep closing down the sites behind us all, I and mean, there used to be a lot of free sites, but why do they keep them open for us to do this? Well, it's not a question of keeping them open. Uh, the people that run these sites um, are selling advertising on the sites, and they make a lot of money. And so the, their business model is that everybody that comes to the site um, has to view their advertising, but their business model is also everybody that comes to the site has to or should be uploading shares for everybody else that comes to the site. Uh, their business model is theft. Um, and so that's why they're being closed down by governments, um, mainly by governments, by um, the the copyright holders that you know they get together with their lawyers and 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 government entities and agencies and say you know grab grab these people and shut them down. Is it still illegal to share the owners? You have to jump through hoops a bit. Um, I think last week I mentioned how this essentially works. If you buy music at the store and you bring it home and you make a backup copy of that because if your copy becomes damaged with scratches or whatever and it will, will no longer play, you're allowed to make a backup copy of something you own. Now let's be clear about what you own. You own the disc. You do not own the content. And so it's perfectly legal fair use that's called the doctrine of fair use to make a backup copy of your music for your own personal use. Is it legal for you to make a copy of that CD and give it to someone? No.
Here again, we have to understand what the copyright holders want from us, what they demand from us, and what what's really good for them. And I must tell you that I don't think the copyright holders know what's good for them. I don't think they do. I do that they do not understand how the public feels about the rights that they hold to this material. If Sony Music sues you because you have given a copy of Sony's, what Sony owns to someone else, and they come after you and sue you, what are they in fact doing? They are in fact suing their own customers. When was the last time you walked into an establishment of any sort and the establishment owner slapped you with a lawsuit because you're a customer? This is what they're doing. They are suing their own customers. Do they know what's good for them if they do that? Common sense would say, no, you do not sue your own customers. Is there a logical reason why people, copyright holders, might allow their stuff to be spread a little wider than what the public is paying for? And it all comes back to this whole idea of discovery. How do you discover new artists? You, put, you take a copy of your music and you take it to your friend and say to them, this artist is great. I really like their stuff. I think you will be interested in it too. With that said, perhaps your friend will say, I think they're great too. I must go down to the music store and purchase this item. What happened? Because your friend discovered this new music, the copyright holder made a sale. But in the first thing, you sharing that copy, copywritten material could have been seen as illegal. But how would your friend discover a new artist if you didn't tell them about it? This. Do the copyright holders know what they're good, what's good for them? No. How if they're doing that? Movies are another story. When you're talking about putting $50 million of your company's money at risk to make a movie, well then perhaps, just perhaps, they have a point when they say, please don't copy our stuff and give it to other people. We lose X amount of dollars every time you do that. We spend X amount of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars promoting our movie, our content to the public and getting the word out that they should go and see this great production. And you give it to somebody else, it's a ticket sale lost to them. Okay? So do they have a point? You bet. Can they do things better? than the way they're doing them now. You bet. Now everybody that has a vested interest in a 50 or 100 million dollar movie, the company that produced the movie, the talent that was in the movie is going to get some sort of residual money out of every showing. Um, the theater owners who 
show you the movie. The advertisers who um, pay hundreds of millions of dollars to this, to, or get paid hundreds of millions of dollars from the studio to advertise these productions, everybody has their finger in the pie. After a movie has been run for, what is it, seven, eight, ten months, a year, then they will put it on a streaming service at $8 a month, like Netflix or Hulu, and you can watch it there if you pay your $8. The movie studios still get a piece of the action, not as much. When do they become public domain? The, the content like this never becomes public domain, ever. The copyright holder has the right to hold that copyright in perpetuity. And if their company ever becomes um, uh, a non-entity, that material is still worth something to somebody who would buy the copyright to it. So the copyrights can be held in perpetuity by anybody. Books is another story. Books, I think, is 75 years. That's why you'll never find a book um, on the internet. Um, books are out there. But, and, and the great literature of the world is there at the print. There is no copyright or Nietzsche or Exactly so. They're buying, yeah, they're, yeah, they're, they're buying the entire catalog that uh, the company, like Metro Goldwyn Mayer, their, company, their catalog was sold years ago. The entire catalog. And um, there may be some gems in there that um, were never released or released in limited run. Um, and, and so these these things are still copyrighted material to the person who bought the copyright from them, and they can put them out on DVD and charge you $12, $15 for a DVD for Harold Lloyd. Great actor. Harold Lloyd's stuff is still copyrighted, albeit that it was... It was done in 1923. He left the industry, I think, sometime in the early 40s. And never looked back, never came back to it. Um, and Harold Lloyd died in the early 70s, I believe. But a, a, a great talent. But his stuff is still copyrighted. And it's worth something to someone who is an old silent movie buff who loves his stuff. And there are people out there willing to pay. And that's why these things continue to be copyrighted. Copyrights held in perpetuity. So, other entertainments that you can find on the internet. Games. Games are a great time waster. Um, and, and if you've got nothing to do for three or four or five hours and you, you don't want to go to, back to bed and lay down for an hour, <laughs> games on computers are a great entertainment. And there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of places where you can play games on the computer um, and um, they are really immersive and the next thing you know you've gone through three hours. Is that a bad thing? 
there are some spouses in this world who would say, that's a bad thing. I've been so lonesome. <laughs> I like that word. <laughs> But there are others who would say of that of the opposite spouse, get away from me. You're bothering me. Yeah, there's a race in about an hour. You want to go watch it? There's nothing wrong with with NASCAR racing. No, I know. And as a matter of fact, uh, if you do it properly, you can you can watch it on just about any device that you may have in your pocket. You can watch it on your computer. You can watch it on your phone. You can watch it on your tablet. They're perfectly willing to sell you this content. That you may sit down and watch a three-hour race. So these kinds of entertainments, uh, games um, and live entertainments, as we as we're talking about NASCAR, uh, baseball, football, racing, soccer, soccer, golf, all of all of these sporting entertainments are available to you. Um, you might have to jump through the odd hoop to get the content legally, like, for instance, paying for a subscription to a cable company so you can live streaming of a sporting event. Okay. There is a technology now, or a way of looking at technology, called over the top. And over the top simply means that the person that owns the content, like Major League Baseball, they're not doing it, but will eventually, they own the content. And they sell the content to ESPN. And so you can watch as many major league games on ESPN as you want, as long as you have a cable subscription. Over the top simply means that Major League Baseball is cutting out ESPN and going directly to the consumer over the internet. Would ESPN enjoy that? No. No. They don't like it in the least. But it's happening. Consumers are demanding it. That why should I pay for a cable subscription of 200 channels, only four of which I'm going to watch, to get this sport content? Why do I have to pay $115 a month and then on top of that, I have to subscribe to the sporting content. Why don't Major League Baseball, Major League Hockey, Soccer, you name the sport, if you're broadcasting it to a cable company, why can't I just buy your content? I'm willing to pay uh, $9 on a Sunday afternoon to watch a complete NASCAR race streamed over the internet. What's wrong with that? I'd love to give them, I'd love to give NASCAR $9 to watch that race uninterrupted. But because NASCAR has sold their uh, sold the cable companies and the broadcasters, Fox for now, ESPN later, the rights to broadcast this, they're not live streaming the race content from the announcers and the analysts. They're live streaming it as just 
on your tablet or your computer if you want to buy it. But there's no announcement. You just watch the race. Okay. I would happily pay them Sunday afternoon to watch the content that I want to watch, that I'm interested in. And I think all of you are too. And that's called over the top. The cable companies, um, the satellite companies, are going to have to be dragged kicking and screaming into the next decade to make this work. They have one way of making money. They can see no other way of making money on this content. I say, companies are stupid. If they can't figure this out, they can make money and give you what you want. What else would you call it? These people do not deserve their jobs. Okay, now that I've ranted and raved on that one, other entertainments that uh, might be coming down the pike for <laughs> okay there are there are games that are free um, the advertising is along the side of the screen and you know uh, the advertisers are hoping not so much that you click on their ads while you're playing the game but that your eyes are involved in their content and so it becomes sort of ingrained in your in your brain that the next time you're walking down the aisle of whatever um, Walmart or, or Target or Big V or whatever, out of the corner of your eye, you will see their product and as an impulse buy, perhaps, or if you're looking for a similar corner of their eye, this thing that's been embedded in your brain from their advertisement, and you go over to the counter and you pick it up. Well, subliminal, I don't think so. I don't think so. It's awful close to it, but uh, still and all, uh, you're being manipulated in some way or another. That's what advertisers do. They Okay, so that's that's the that's getting content for free. Your eyeballs must be engaged somehow in the advertiser's content. There's another way to get games for free, but they're also called in-app purchases. And so the one one of the most notorious ones is called the Simpsons Tapped Out. Now, it's a game you play on your phone or your tablet. You can't play it on your computer. And you can play the game to a certain level. And then all of a sudden, you get stuck. And what do you need to continue in the game? You need three donuts. For Homer. There is a way to get the three donuts for free, and that's to... Hammer on the game for another hour, turn up a donut or two. But and in that purchase of three donuts for Homer to continue in his quest in the game, you fork over a dollar. In app purchases. Um, you know going into the game that if you want to play the game and have a good time with it, you're probably going to have to make the in-app purchases. Where these people get into real trouble is that they make a game that kids play and they don't say up front that if you click this certain 
these certain buttons. You're going to give me a dollar. And so the kids just play along. Oh, I need these three donuts. Click. There's a dollar. Ten minutes later, oh, three more donuts. Click. Off goes another. And at the end of the month, Dad can't figure out where $43 went off of his credit card. Well, you have when you set up the game, you have to set up your your information. Yeah. Yeah. Right, but but you see where that kind of that kind of thing is going. Um, is something like, like that. Um, I, I think the public is not going to be smarter than they're not going to them uh, as much as they did a couple of years ago when these games first started to appear. Everybody jumped on the band like that. Game number three. Games that you purchase. You purchase the disc and you play the game and you need a powerful computer to play it properly and to have an inclusive experience in the game. Um, those games, they're great. They really and truly are great. If you've got a computer and a big monitor, a nice set of headphones, you can sit down and you can play that game for days and have a good time doing it. Um, and inside of the game, um, there are the games are built with all kinds of paths to go down. So once you've completed the game, you can go back and play it again and take a different path to it. So you can still have that immersive experience. These games are not cheap. You could pay seventy to a hundred dollars for that kind of game. Other entertainments. Yes, if you're into bridge, you're into chess. If you were, um, yeah. But um, I I have a chess game on my tablet that has twenty levels. I've I've never gotten past a game and I've played it all day in the fifth level. The computer beats me every time. But if you're a good chess player, you can get you can start advancing in these levels. And what's really really interesting about these game, these chess, particularly the high end chess games, is you can tell the computer, show me how you're thinking about your next move, which I find fascinating. At my level five, I make my move, and then I, I wait for the computer to make its next move. But before it does, I say to the computer, show me what you're thinking about on how you're going to make this next move that is going to beat me. <laughs> no, no, it, it just gives me all of the options the computer is about to take. So I get a, an overview of how the computer is thinking about the game. And if I want to improve my chess game, that's the way I should be doing it. Beat me. That. But how? How is it going to do it? I find that part of, of playing the game more important than just playing the game to a stalemate or I lose. <laughs>